All right. Welcome, welcome to Next Step Bible Church. I have really missed you guys. I've been gone for a couple weeks, and it is so good to be back. We have just a couple announcements tonight. It was funny. Last night, Suzanne and I were texting, and she was telling me the announcements, and there was only two. And so I said, well, do you want me to say anything else? She said, yeah, whatever God puts on your heart. If it's a Bible verse or something that he's been, you know, talking to you about. And I said, well, I got nothing. <laughs> But then last night I was working on the prayer line and he reminded me about something he has been working on me about. It's funny how we forget that, (laughs) but um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Our first announcement is uh, Frontline this Tuesday, 6 to 8 at Shoney's in Lebanon. And then we have a save the date for you. We are super excited about our Christmas party coming up on Tuesday, December 5th. It will be here at Launch Point. So details to come about that. And that is it as far as announcements. So this is what the Lord was, has been working on me about. That a gentleman last night reminded me. Um, and he didn't even know he reminded me about it, of course. But that's how the Lord works. So when we look at people through the flesh, we tend to say, you know, oh, she did it again. You know, I knew that was going to happen. I knew she would say that. I knew she would do that again. But, and if we're not careful, we can word curse them. And so he's been working on me looking at people through the spirit. Because when we look at people through the spirit, we don't keep a record of wrongs and instead of saying all those things we say man that's not what God wants for you man that's not God's will for your life that's not what he has for you and we look at them with a different perspective and I'll be honest it's hard to look at people like that especially people who have done you wrong over and over and over And you have it in your head, you know, they're going to do it again. Well, they will because you just word curse them. But we need to look at people through the spirit and, and see that it's really not them. It could be a demonic spirit that is attached to them. And so when we look at people like that, it just gives us a whole different perspective. And that's what loving like Jesus is. So he's been working on me, and I hope that helps y'all. So anyway, we'll pray, and then we'll worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, Father. We love you so much. We thank you for everything you're doing in this place, Father. I pray you open our hearts to worship and the word. Um, Just move in a mighty way over us, Father. Fill us up. Pour your spirit out on us. Just fill this place with your spirit, Father. Be with Danny as he preaches the word, as he decreases himself and increases you in him, Father. Just continue to be a light shining through all of us, Father. We love you and we praise you and we give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Worship. Stand up. We'll worship and come forward if you want to. Amen. Amen. He's worthy of all, right? Oh, my goodness. I am so fired up, not because of the message. <laughs> I'll explain that in a second. Um, we're continuing on. <laughs> it's an unofficial series that we're doing on attributes of God. As some of you know, but not all of you know, my father-in-law visited us, I guess it's about three weeks ago now. And I, whenever he's in town, he, he's a retired pastor. I ask him to speak and preach because uh, I love when he speaks and preaches, and, and uh, I get a chance to get fed instead of feed. And um, he came up with this booklet. Um, it's, uh, let's see here. There's 58 attributes of God that he came up with a list. He made this little booklet, and he brought a copy for everyone. We still have some in the back if you'd like to have one. It is awesome. And... Uh, when he went back home to Charleston, South Carolina, I have my copy, and I was looking at it. Like, you know, there's so much good stuff in here, so many excellent attributes. I'm going to uh, ride his coattails and keep it going. So since he's been gone, we spoke about uh, the attributes of God, God being a jealous God. Uh, we talked about God being a sanctifier. And so <laughs> 
here's kind of, it, it's real uh, spiritual how I do this. So I go through and I go, all right, let's go through the list. And as I'm going through the list, I'm like, Lord, if you want something to jump off the page at me, well, let it jump off the page at me. <laughs> that's, that's how spiritual it is. And, but here's the deal. He listens and he answers. And so uh, I will start with number one. This is what happened this week. I want to share it with you. Number one, God is almighty. And he has each attribute, and he has a Bible verse to back it up. Number two, God is awesome. These are attributes of God. Number three, God is a covenant keeper. Oh, I like that one. Number four, God is compassionate. Like, all right, that's a good one. Number five, God is the creator. Like, ooh, okay. Number six, God disciplines. I'm like, oh, whatever. I go turn the page, Lord, and up, go back. Oh, wait a minute. I just got to number six. Uh, you know, there's 50 some in here, and he goes, no, go back. I said, it must be one of the first six. So I go back to the beginning. He goes, no, no, no. You know which one I'm talking about. This is number six, God disciplines. I'm like, of all the ones in this book, that's the one you want me to speak on? Come on. He goes, yeah, I want my people to hear that. He goes, not, church, no many, not many churches are teaching or preaching on God being a disciplinarian. Uh, too many churches are sugarcoating their messages. Uh, there's too much cotton candy preaching that's out there, and the Lord's done with it. We're entering a new season uh, as a body of Christ. Uh, things are changing all around the world. Uh, if you just turn the TV on or any kind of news, you can see uh, stuff going on in Israel, Palestine, uh, everything. It's just crazy right now. So God's like, we need to up our game as a body of Christ. We need to uh, equip the saints. So he's calling on us pastors to teach on these things that we uh, don't really want to teach on, uh, that aren't very popular. But I always say in this church, we're not going to shy away from tough topics. We're just not. If the Lord tells me to teach on it, I'm going to be obedient. So here's the deal. I don't want to preach this message. I wrestled with the Lord, and you know who won that one. And uh, <laughs> I'm just being honest. Lord, I don't want to teach on discipline and because... <laughs> Once I got into it, discipline is all through the Word of God. It is all through the Word of God. Of course, we're going to get into that today. Uh, we'll warn you, uh, we're going to be covering a lot of Bible today. I have three main passages I'm going to be in, but a lot of reference scripture. Uh, if you would like, instead of skipping all around the Bible, we're going to have the main verses up here on the screens. You can just follow along that way so you can get fed and learn instead of being distracted, digging all through the Bible. But if you're one of those Bible nerds like me and you want to keep up, oh, good luck. <laughs> Go for it. I'm all for that. I didn't want to teach this lesson. Um, it's not fun. <laughs> Some messages you just can't wait to get into, you know, you, 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 you're like, oh, man, I'm already... Seeing stories, I'm seeing some application here. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and I did with this one, but it was not so fun. Not so fun. Well, I'm going to start off with a story. And then after my story, I'll pray when we get into the Word. I remember when I was young and single, and I was playing drums at a church. I was on the worship team and very involved with church. I was part of the men's ministry uh, not leading it, but just a part of it. Very plugged into church. I was pretty much to church whenever the doors are open because I love God. I love church. Uh, I love the friends that I made at church. That was my church family. My, my real family was crazy, and I didn't really want to hang out with them. But I wanted to hang out with my church family. And so I had a girlfriend that went to church there as well. And uh, she lived in a, she rented a room in a house. And so very often, you guys remember Blockbuster Home Video? <laughs> oh, man, I'm dating myself. But, man, it was, it was awesome on a Friday to go and pick a couple movies, rent a movie or two, and go home and watch them and order a pizza. That's just what you did when you were single back then in the 90s. And uh, so uh, we rented a movie and ordered a pizza and whatnot. In fact, we ordered a couple movies. And so without realizing it, I ended up staying over there really late watching the movies. <laughs> I promise that's all that was happening. But it was like 2 o'clock in the morning when the movie ended. Got in my car, went back to my house, and uh, that was that. <laughs> we 
Well, the next morning, I got a call from my pastor. So apparently, the people living across the street also went to church and said, hey, your drummer's over here shacking up. Because <laughs> they saw me, you know, they went to bed like at 10 and saw my car was there, and they went on to bed. They didn't know I left at 2 o'clock in the morning. But they called my pastor, and my pastor calls me. Says, hey, man, you shacking up? I was like, no, man. It wasn't for the lack of trying. But anyway, I was like, no. I'm just being honest. And so, but she was a godly woman. So anyway, I, so he goes, I need you to come to my office. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, we need to have a talk. Oh, man. So I went, and I sat in his office, and I got what I call a spiritual spanking. Now, spiritual spanking is when you're in trouble. You remember in school, you have to go to principal's office? Well, that's the same way at church. If you get in trouble, you got to go to the pastor's office. <laughs> just like, I'm an adult. I'm like 23 or 24 at the time. I'm like, really? I got to go to the pastor's office? Come on, I'm an adult. No. Nope. He had to have a man-to-man talk with me. He said, look. He asked me about the situation. I explained what I just told you. Look, I left at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was okay. They don't know that. They just see the church drummer coming over to his girlfriend's house, and it, by the time they go to bed, your car's still there. So they're worried about your character and integrity. Well, I'm so, I'm so happy they're worried about my character, you know. <laughs> so uh, he says, okay, well, here's the deal. Um, uh, I, I received my spiritual spanking, my rebuke, um, even though I didn't really do anything wrong. He says, it looks wrong. It looks wrong. And when you're in ministry, whether you're on a worship team, you're leading a men's ministry, a marriage ministry, you're a pastor, in leadership, you're called to a higher calling. you got to walk with integrity and character. He goes, from now on, I would appreciate it if by 10 p.m. you weren't over at her house. And I agreed. He goes, it's a bad look. Even if nothing is going on, watch your movies earlier in the day. Okay, I got you. I give you my word, and I kept my word. So one thing he brought up to me was 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 and 23. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read this. It says, abstain from the appearance of evil. Mm. That is so important. Abstain from the appearance of evil. Watch this. And the very God of peace will sanctify you completely. Last we talked about God being a sanctifier. Sanctification is purification. It's a walk towards holiness and righteousness. We never really get there, but we should always be striving for it. Abstain from the appearance of evil. Wow. Even if you're not doing any evil, just the very appearance of it, you're making people wonder. You might say, well, it's none of their business. Hey, it is your business because you represent the Lord. You represent God. We should be walking in purity and holiness. And even if the appearance of things are not good, that's on you. All right, so I wanted to open with that story because I received some discipline from my pastor. Was it uncomfortable? Yes. Was it weird talking to him about my girlfriend and our relationship? Yeah, it was weird, but, um, but it had to happen, and it was good. Because you know what it did? It raised my awareness. Because from that point forward, I started thinking about things I said and things I did and how it was received by others because the church was a huge mega church. There was thousands of people that saw me on those drums every week. So whether I was at the mall, uh, out and about, whatever, you never know who's watching. You have to walk accordingly. All right. So discipline is an attribute of God. And I want to cover two things today. And I only have a few short hours to do that. That's funny. Come on. <laughs> two questions. Who does God discipline? Second question. Why does God discipline? Like, all right, that seems pretty simple. Ha, ah, buckle up. Buckle up. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, if you will, or we'll have it on the screen. Like I said, if you want to just kind of sit there and absorb. The discipline of God is the subtitle in my Bible. Uh, Hebrews 12, we're starting in, uh, we're going to be going through verses 3 through 11. Hebrews 12, verse 3. Everybody there? Okay, here we go. I'm going to read it. For, con for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. 
and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Then there's a quote, my son, do not spise the chastening or the disciplining, that's what chastening means, the disciplining of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. In other words, don't be discouraged when you receive a spiritual spanking from God because you will receive a spiritual spanking from God sometime, eventually. It happens to all of us. By the way, uh, a rebuke is also a form of discipline. In verse 6, it continues, For whom the Lord loves, I have that underlined, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. In other words, if he loves you, he's going to discipline you. It's right here in Scripture. And it goes on in verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Uh, The meaning of scourge is to cause great trouble or suffering. Oh, great, Lord. (laughs) Thanks. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you As with sons. That is so important right there. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, verse 8, by the way, is very scary and should be very sobering. Watch this. But if you are without chastening, in other words, if God is not disciplining you, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Oh, That carries some weight. Verse 9, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. In other words, we obeyed their rules. We obeyed their uh, commands that they laid down. Then it goes on to say, Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Verse 10, For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. In other words, discipline is a part of the sanctification process. We should always be working on our sanctification. In other words, uh, being more Christ-like, talking more Christ-like, thinking more Christ-like, living more Christ-like. That is walking in sanctification And discipline is part of that. Verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Isn't that the truth? (laughs) I'll read that again. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. There's that purity again, that sanctification, to those who have been trained by it. I had that word trained underlined a few times so question number one who does god discipline it tells us in verse six watch this for whom the lord loves he chastens god disciplines those he loves verse seven watch this if you endure chastening god deals with you as with sons god disciplines his children if you've asked christ in your heart and you're saved guess what This is you he's talking about. Verse 8 says, But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Do not miss this, y'all. God only disciplines his children. (laughs) Grandpa used to say, You don't mow another man's lawn. (laughs) Likewise, you don't discipline other people's children. Although I sure wish I could sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> Amen, preacher, pastor. Discipline is correction. And we all need correction. Watch this. Discipline is training. And we all need training. Discipline is instruction. And we all need instruction. See, uh, you know, it, it warns us <laughs> that when you're disciplined, it, it's painful. It hurts. It stings. It stinks. It just does. But, it's for our benefit. It benefits us. Um, we train our children. We teach our children. We instruct our children. We say, don't touch that. It's hot. Or don't go near that knife. It's sharp. 
Don't go near the street. There's cars whizzing by. Don't put that penny in the outlet. You'll get shocked. Don't date a musician. They're bad news. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny right there. <clears throat> Once again, preacher, pastor. <laughs> I joke because I am a retired drummer, so I R1. Um, <laughs> I R1. So if you've ever played sports, they have sports camps. How many here ever uh, been to a sports camp of some sort? Okay, there's a, there's a handful. Um, now, don't laugh, <laughs> but when I was young and a lot slender, more slender, uh, I was very athletic. I was all, if I had a ball, I was involved. Now, I'm from a small farm town. If they would have had soccer, I'd have played soccer, but they didn't have soccer. They had the big three. They had basketball, football, and baseball, and then they had a little more basketball on top of that. It was a basketball town. And that's just the way it is up in Illinois and Indiana, the Hoosiers and all that. It's big basketball country. When you're born, you're handed a basketball. Well, so I was the same way. My whole family uh, played high school basketball, Division I, high, uh, college basketball. I mean, basketball ran in the family. And all my nephews, not, not joking, are all 6'6", 6'7", 6'5", and I'm 5'10". I'm the runt. But here's the deal. Growing up, I was actually the most athletic of all of them. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Looking at me, you couldn't tell that now. But I was. And every year, the highlight was basketball camp, which happened in the summer. Um, if I made decent grades and all that kind of stuff, my grandfather would uh, pay for me to go to basketball camp. <clears throat> and I did. I would excel at basketball camp. But here's what basketball camp's for, and really all sports camps. Uh, they train you. They instruct you. And you go through a bunch of discipline. Uh, I learned all kind of new moves. I learned how to hold the basketball properly. I learned the proper form to shoot. Um, I learned a proper way to dribble with both hands. Uh, if you're left-handed, you favor your left hand when you dribble. If you're right hand, you favor your right hand. But in basketball, you need to favor both hands as you work uh, against the other players. So they would work on agility of both hands. All that to say is there was a lot of discipline and instruction that went on in sports. Well, it's likewise in our life. We need to have instruction. We need to have training. We need to have discipline. And so although discipline carries this negative connotation to it, it, it benefits us. It's to our profit, if, if you will. Um, Proverbs 13.1, listen to this. says, a wise son heeds his father's instruction. Um, <laughs> I'll share another quick story. Uh, as far as uh, not heeding my father's instruction. When I was five years old, and I'll make this real quick. My wife says, your stories go too long. Okay, I'll make them short. All right. So, <laughs> but it's pertinent. So uh, I went to my cousin's uh, birthday and he, they were much older than me. They were like 12, 13, 14. I was five. And his birthday present was this hyped up racing go-kart. It was phenomenal. Oh, it was awesome. No joke. It could get up to 60 miles an hour. And so my cousins are zipping around this trailer park. That should be a clue. Uh, it was zipping around this trailer park and, and, and dodging trees and going all this gravel kicking up. And as a five-year-old, it was cool. And I was like, man, I want to ride that. My dad said, listen here. Your cousins are a lot older than you. You are too young to ride that go-kart. You stick to your, your big wheel. <laughs> well, I don't want to go. My big wheel wouldn't go 60 miles an hour. All right? So. We ran out of ice. So my drunk uncle, that's a big part of the story. Uh, my drunk uncle, when my dad went to get ice, he goes, hey, <laughs> looking back on this is spiritual now. Think about it. My drunk uncle says, hey, I know you want to ride that go-kart. Your dad's going, you should jump out. Nobody's riding it right now. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, zip it around here a few times before he gets back. He'll be gone 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> well, grandpa, I mean, uncle, what is the coolest uncle on the planet at that point? So I get into that thing. And I, 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 it was, I was too little, so I had to lay down, and my feet could barely touch the pedal. But as soon as I hit that gas pedal, I went, I just, it went full force. You know, I'm five, you know. And so the thing just peeled out and shot and just went straight. Well, at top speed, I went into a, a Carolina a pine tree that was about this big around at 60 miles an hour, straight on. No seatbelt, no helmet. My face went right into the steering wheel. Broke the steering wheel, broke my jaw, knocked all my bottom teeth out, blood everywhere. So my dad shows up from getting ice to see an ambulance in the front. And, and I'm on a stretcher uh, at the point I cannot feel my lower extremities. They think I have a broken neck and I'm paralyzed. My dad and mom were flipped out. 
if I'd have just obeyed my dad. He didn't have to discipline me. <laughs> I was already disciplined. A go-kart disciplined me. But looking back on it, honestly, I think the devil was trying to kill me that day. Um, because later on in life, I had a paint company. And I had to do a, a ceiling repair in this lady's house. And so I knocked on her door. And this just beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> large black lady <laughs> answered the door. She goes, honey, are you here to fix my ceiling? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She goes, you come on in. And so I got up on the ladder, I started working on her ceiling. And she sat at her dining room table, and she just looked at me smiling. I said, what you smiling at? She goes, the man of God that's in my dining room. I was like, how'd you know that? She goes, I'm a prophetess. Okay. And she goes, mm. She goes, God is all over your life, sweetheart. She goes, oh, the Lord's showing me what your future is so good. And I was like skeptical, like, all right, that's nice, whatever, I'll keep working. And she goes, you know, when you were five years old, the devil tried to kill you. But that pine tree that God put in front of you saved your life. And I was like, what'd you just say? And she goes, yeah, I know. I'm not supposed to know that, am I? I said, you got my full attention. And then she started prophesying over me, telling me how God was going to use me in incredible ways in my future that would just blow me away. And she wasn't allowed to tell me, but she just wanted to plant the seed so I, I would be encouraged and inspired. Wow, looking back on that, that was a spiritual thing that took place. But it all was because I was disobedient. It all came from disobedience. Um, God could have... Uh, made the uh, engine on that go-kart stall out, die, whatever. But instead, he put a tree there and I had to go through uh, about my neck and my jaw. My jaw was, uh, was uh, cracked. They had to re-implant all my bottom teeth. My uh, spinal cord was bruised. That's why I couldn't feel my lower extremities. Within 24 hours, it all came back. That could have been a miracle. Maybe I was paralyzed. I don't know. I don't know. But God gave me my, my extremities back and all that in a crazy accident. Um, I do think I was disciplined. I, I, I think God disciplined on me. That you, you need to obey from now on. When your dad tells you something, you listen. And boy, my life was different after that. So I just want to share that. Um, it didn't end up being a short story, but sorry. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 13, 24 says, Whoever spares the rod, watch this, hates their children. I'm like, man, the Lord, that's a strong word. <laughs> Whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful, I have that part underlined, to discipline them. Um, disciplining your children and abusing your children are two completely different things. Growing up, I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I, I was uh, privy to a lot of abuse. Uh, my dad would spank us till he got tired. I'm not joking or making it up. I'm not exaggerating. Dad would spank us till he got tired. And there was a few times he took a break. And when he rested up, he came and continued, not exaggerating. That's not discipline. That's abuse. But it says here, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Thank you, Lord, for that word in there. Um, I was at the, uh, talk about sparing the rod. I was at a Chinese buffet the other day. And uh, oh, and oh, my Lord. Uh, so it was pretty dead in there. Uh, and this family, I guess, thought it was OK to let like their six year old son and four year old daughter have complete access to the whole restaurant and the bar uh, of buffet food. And I was just watching them. They were going playing in the food, running around playing tag, all the kind of stuff. I'm like, <laughs> my kids would have never gotten out of the seat. Now, you know, Dad, can I go get more food at buffet? Yes, go. You can tell there was no rod in that family. They spared the rod way too much. And uh, their children were proof of that. Boy, I sure wish I could have just five minutes with one of those kids. <laughs> They'd have been sitting down and <laughs> behaving. Anyway, Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. If you don't train your child, the world will. If you don't train your child, the world will. They have no problem. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Huh. Ask me how I know that. That was me when I was a kid. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Oh, that's good preaching right there. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I love the word of God. So who does God discipline? His children. God disciplines his children. This brings us to question 
Number two, why does God discipline? Mm. When you were a child and you needed to be disciplined, why was that? It's because you were being naughty. (laughs) You were disobeying rules that your parents had made for you. Reminder, by the way, discipline is correction, and we all need correction. Discipline is training, and we all need training. I said this before, I'm saying it again. Discipline is instruction. We all need instruction. So there are multiple reasons why, which is the question, that God disciplines us. Okay. A few examples. Correction keeps us in line. Correction keeps us in line. It helps us fear Him. Oh, man. I think one of the biggest problems with the body of Christ today in America is the lack of fear of the Lord. I, I am, that's a hill I'm willing to die on. We need to fear the Lord. All of us need to fear the Lord. And you may wonder, well, why would God want us to fear Him? It's a reverence. It's not a fear of like of being scared of Him. Because if you have an abusive father, you're scared of that father. No, But if you have a father that disciplines you correctly, like Scripture says, you have this reverence for your dad. You fear your dad. (laughs) Dad does that. He says at one time, you listen, because there's fear. He has a paddle. In my dad's case, it was a belt. (laughs) God's case, he has lightning bolts. (laughs) Wake up. (laughs) It does. We need to fear the Lord. It reminds us of our place. There is an order to God's economy. And nothing compares to him. God shares a spotlight with nothing or no one. He is a jealous God. We went over that. So correction keeps us in line. Another thing, guidance directs our path. God's discipline flushes out any arrogance or pride that we may have. You know, when, uh, when we disobey God, many of the times, if not all the times, is because of our arrogance and pride. I want to do it my way, God, not your way. That's pride. That's arrogance. In other words, my way is better than your way, God. And God's like, really? Here, hold my wine. No, we need to do it God's way. God's way, his discipline, flushes out any pride or arrogance that we may have. We're going to get into that a little bit here in Scripture. But moving along, testing produces Strength and faith. You know, God will test us. He will test you, can test you, and is going to test you. That's just the way. That's the way he works. It's all part of the journey. Testing, which is another way of a discipline, produces strength and faith. Another thing, elevation brings forth spiritual maturity. And how do we get elevation? Through discipline. See, discipline can guide us if we listen. Those last three words are important. If we listen. God has a plan for you. He has a destiny for all of us. And he wants to fulfill his calling in us. But it takes discipline. And that discipline will lead us to our calling. Another thing. It shapes our character and integrity. (laughs) Discipline will redirect you when you get lost or begin to rebel. Matthew 18, 12 says, If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains and seek the one that is straying? I think it's so cool. We sang that today, and she didn't even know that. Um, It says, and if he should find it, it surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Kind of sounds like the prodigal son story, doesn't it? It goes on to say, even so... It is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God cares about all of his children. Um, I do want to address a myth. As I was reading this, uh, this passage, uh, I went on a bunny trail because there's a thing off to the side. And it said, uh, Christian myths about this passage. I'm like, ooh, all right, what's the myth about this passage? Many people teach that back then, if a, 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 a baby or adult sheep, whatever, would, would go off, that the shepherd would break its leg. That's false. That's, that's, that's a myth. People teach that all the time. 
Um, and if you look everywhere, you can't find that. Um, so it's a myth that a shepherd would break a lamb's leg so it wouldn't wander off again. Here's the reason. This would be very dangerous. I, I copied and pasted this. I'm reading from this article. This would be very dangerous and could kill the animal or maim it. Instead, what really happened is the shepherd would discipline it, the little rebellion fellow, by placing a cowbell or a bell on it, on the lamb or sheep, so the shepherd would hear and notice if it began to wander off. That's what they did. I'm like, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> naughty, naughty sheep, they break your leg. <laughs> ah, that's kind of harsh, but no, that's not what happened. I just wanted to, to reiterate that myth because um, I'd heard that pl- plenty of times. I thought that's just what they did. Um, anyway, you may be asking yourself, uh, Pastor Danny, <laughs> is there any way to avoid God's discipline? I have good news. Yes. All you got to do is obey every single command he's ever commanded. That's all you got to do, which isn't easy to do. Good luck with that. <laughs> all of us sin and fall short. All of us will be disciplined at some point or another. Let's look at some examples in Scripture uh, where God disciplined his children. Turn to Genesis chapter 19, if you will. This is the second big passage we're going to look at, dig into a little bit for a few minutes. We're going to talk about Lot's wife. We're going to talk about some characters in the Bible that received some discipline. We'll start with Lot's wife. Everybody there? Genesis 19, verse 12. Genesis 19, verse 12. Then the men, by the way, the men were angels. That's very important to know in this story. Then the men said to Lot, now, just as a reminder, Lot was Abraham's nephew. I want to educate you guys, equip you guys, um, if you didn't know that already. So, then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. He was very clear about that. I have that underlined. Verse 13, and it explains why. For we will destroy this place because of the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. This shows another uh, attribute of God, by the way, which is holiness. Because where they were uh, being led out of, was, was so evil and corrupt, God was going to destroy it because of its evil. Verse 14, we'll get more into that in a second. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Watch this, though. But his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. They did not take him seriously. This shows their heart. Um, I believe it shows that they're unsaved. Because they're like, whatever, this, this God of yours is going to destroy this place? Huh, whatever. Just did not believe it. They, seemed, they thought he was joking. Verse 15. When the morning dawned, uh, that jumped out at me. They didn't leave immediately. There wasn't a sense of urgency. They waited till the next morning. Uh, by the way, delayed obedience is disobedience. Have you heard that before? Oh, I've heard that a lot. Delayed obedience and disobedience. My wife just had our kids all the time. That was her saying. But it is. Um, it says the angels urged Lot to hurry. I got the word urged underlined and the word hurry underlined. I always do that with these key words. I underline them because words in the Bible have meaning. So when the morning dawned, like I said, they procrastinated. The angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters. Guess who was not in that group? The sons-in-laws. In other words, take those who believe and leave those who do not believe. They didn't make the cut. They didn't take them seriously. Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. So there's about to be some discipline. Punishment. Uh, in other words, if you don't obey now, you will die. You're going to be consumed. He's reiterating this urgency. Verse 16. And while they lingered, see that? Oh, I got that word underlined. While they lingered, the men, in other words, the angels, took hold of his hands. I can see them dragging. Get out of here. It's coming. Let's go. Um, I wonder why they were. This just hit me just now. 
and why they lingered. Why were they lingering? Um, I blame Lot's wife only because of what happens coming up in the next couple verses. Um, this has hit me now. I think they were lingering because she was trying to gather things and stuff to take. In other words, leave it all behind. Everything here, everything that you have and everything you own is connected to this evil town. Leave it all. You're starting a brand new life. Do not bring anything toxic or evil or satanic or demonic. Leave it all here and go. But they lingered. I think she was trying to gather some stuff. I, but I don't want to leave this behind. I don't want to leave this behind. This means a lot to me. Mm, that just hit me. Could be wrong. That's just Danny Bean. But And while he lingered, the men or the angels took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Finally got his gang outside the city. Because discipline and punishment was coming. Verse 17. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. He's not even sugarcoating it. He's not, th- he's not saying, no, things are about to get rough around here. No, everybody here is about to die. Like dead, gone. If you want to save your life, go. Get out of here. So it came to pass when he brought them outside, he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, watch this, lest you be destroyed. So right here in this verse, we see a command given, escape for your life, and do not look behind you. And then uh, it's an assignment was given, uh, followed by a consequence. The consequence is, lest you be destroyed. Very clear assignment. Then Lot said to them, Please, no, my lords. <laughs> Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and die. So see now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there, and my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. So it's like they're kind of cutting a deal. Um, Verse 22, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. He wants to make sure they're safe. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, you read that right. Sodom and Gomorrah. God rained brimstone. It says, from the Lord out of the heavens. Verse 25. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. Not to be gross, but this means men, women, children, and babies. There's a consequence to sin, y'all. It's not pretty. You're like, well, why would God do that? And here's what they say. Why would a loving God do that? Um, let's take that loving part out. God's a judge. He's a judge. And he judges uh, uh, righteousness from unrighteousness. Holiness from unholiness. He's a judge. He has to stand right or he would not be a, a good judge. If, if, if he favored those who were in sin, he favored those who were in unholiness. Like, I don't know about a God like that. That's the way it works. God is God. You are not. This is why I'm like, do I have to preach this? He said, yes, my people need to fear me. Nobody's fearing me anymore. It's okay. <laughs> He's a disciplinarian, y'all. Watch this. I'm going to read 25 again because it goes right into 26, which is the big aha moment so he overthrew those cities all the plain all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground even the plants verse 26 but his wife looked back behind him right there she disobeyed she disobeyed what comes with disobedience discipline and she became a pillar of salt there's always a consequence when you disobey. You know, I was like, Lord, wow. Why didn't you just like make her blind or something? Because she's looking back, like take her eyesight away or something. What's up with that? Why a pillar of salt? 
He said, because Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Oh, all right, Lord. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I fear you. Not out of being scared of the Lord, out of reverence, out of reverence. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Hmm. Lot's wife was holding on to her past. That's why she looked back. The place and things she and her family were leaving behind were so evil, so corrupt, so perverted that God did not want them to even look at it. Don't even set your eyes upon that filth. Sodom and Gomorrah represented hell on earth. It was pure evil. God was extending his grace by allowing them to escape. God gave them a direct command through the angels and Lot's wife disobeyed. In essence, she mocked God and his goodness, which came with a consequence. Um, I tell you, I get God winks. Uh, that's when God says something or lets something land on my spirit when I'm in my office. And I know it came from God because I'm not that smart. So I call him God winks. He gave me one this morning. I, Sunday morning routine. I have my coffee and I go downstairs and my, my church office is in the basement of my house. And I'm going over my notes. And every time he shows up with a God wink right here, what, what was a, a God wink? He was like, whenever one of my children uh, disobey me, they mock me. Oh, that's how he sees it. Um, and God will not be mocked. <laughs> you ever mocked your parents? <laughs> I think I did like once, maybe twice. I don't remember because I was unconscious afterwards. But <laughs> I've heard a couple of times that. I mocked my dad, you know, and uh, I'd say arrogance and pride. No, it was just stupidity. <laughs> oh, boy, my past. But anyway, but God gave me that. Whenever my children disobey me, they mock me. I was like, wow, that really that puts a whole new meaning on it for me personally. I don't ever want to mock God. I, I, <laughs> oh, I fear the Lord. I don't want to mock you, God. Then obey me. Tell my people they better obey me. Okay. Because Lot's wife mocked him. He gave her a command. He's helping her. He's saving her life. He's bringing her to freedom. She has a whole awesome future ahead of her. But she had to look back at her past. The stuff that he was bringing her out of. And he felt mocked when she did that. Mm. You may think this discipline is way too harsh. But I love to talk about how we look at things uh, in the natural. And how God looks at everything in the supernatural. And how we need to get rid of this worldly mindedness and adapt a kingdom mindedness and start looking at anything and everything through God's eyes, not our eyes, because our eyes are flawed. So we need to look at things in the supernatural. God doesn't play. Like I said, he's a judge. The heart of Lot's wife was exposed in this story. By looking back, it shows us that part, if not all of her heart, was back in Sodom. There was things back there that she loved, that she longed for. You know, I think she was saved, which obviously because he he brought them out and I felt like the sons-in-laws weren't saved. But I think she was saved, but I think she was double-minded. You know what they say about double-minded man? Unstable in all their ways. I think that's what happens. Scripture warns us that, uh, that if we love the world, which is a fallen world, and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. I think that's, oh, I think that's what was going on here. Instead of looking forward to the freedom from the wrath of Sodom, Lot's wife chose to train her focus on evil instead. Instead of the blessing she was about to step into. Um, I was watching one of these shows. Uh, I like these uh, crime shows and all that. I like, I'll tell you about that a lot. And uh, I like how they, the CSI people figure out through DNA and fingerprints. On, I love the science behind it. Well, uh, I saw this one show that this, this fits in with the story. There was a house on fire. Firefighters got there. Fire department showed up. Um, got inside. The house was engulfed in flames, but they were able to get the whole family out. The whole family's on the lawn, safe, good to go. But the father remembered something inside that he had to have. So before anybody could stop him or anything, he bolted. See? They hear <laughs> Part of my story, I couldn't have cued that better. Anyway. For those of you watching online, the ambulance or something went by. Anyway, 
But before anybody could do it, the, the father ran back into the house because there was something that was a valuable or there was something inside that house that he had to get his hands on to, to save it. And as soon as he ran back in the house, the house collapsed and killed him. It made me think of Lot's wife. He had everything. He was in the front yard. He had a whole future with his family. Uh, all right, maybe the house burnt down, but he still has his health. His family is still okay. The, what a blessing. But no, he had to be selfish. He had to be self-centered. Uh, he had to run back into the danger to grab whatever he thought was important that he couldn't live without, and it cost him his life. It was the same with Lot's wife. Hmm. If she would just went with the blessings that was before her, the freedom, the safety, even God's covering. But no. In Deut Deuteronomy 8, 6, watch it says, Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to Him and revering Him. Oh, that's good. In 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, God cannot, well, no, God did not spare angels when they sinned. Oh, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Even angels get disciplined. Even angels. Angels get disciplined. God does not mess around with this stuff. Um, all right, we looked at Lot's wife. Let's look at Adam and Eve. A good old Adam and Eve. Their first human couple, good old Adam and Eve, were disciplined by God for their disobedience in the Garden of Eden. As a result of their actions, they were expelled from paradise and faced the hardships of a fallen world. The story teaches us the importance of obedience and the consequences of succumbing to temptation. They were disciplined. You got to go. You had paradise. You messed it up. Too bad. Now you got disciplinary action. Get out. Mm. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, you will obey if you love me. That's pretty convicting, isn't it? <laughs> it's a short verse, but man, that kind of digs at my heart a little bit. If you love me, mm, I do love you, Lord. Are you keeping my commandments? Well, most of them, uh, I'm not a most kind of God. I'm an all kind of God. Mm, yes, Lord. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Whoo! That just throws salt on the wound. I was already feeling convicted from that previous verse. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Hmm. <laughs> that sounds like something my dad said. Why do you call me dad and not do what I tell you? Oh, uh, come stupid. God gave Adam and Eve specific instructions and they disobeyed and they needed to be disciplined. Next, uh, we're going to talk about Moses. Turn to Numbers chapter 20. It, and if not, they'll be up here on the board. Talk about Moses. Moses got disciplined. You're like, Moses? Yeah, Moses is like awesome. He's like one of the, the, the most well-known characters in all of Scripture. And guess what? He didn't escape discipline. <laughs> you know why? Because God disciplines his children. And Moses was one of his kids. Numbers 20. We'll start in verse 2. It says, now there was no water for the congregation. So let's let you know. <laughs> Moses is leading this group. And they're out in the desert. So, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. Great. Talk about friends. Um. Verse 3, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. <laughs> Crack me up. Verse 4, why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? <laughs> Man, they're being real dramatic. Verse 5, and why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. It's like, you could have taken it somewhere where it had a lot of greenery, a lot of fruit and vegetation growing everywhere and just water everywhere. No, you had to bring us to this desert. That's what they're saying. And continue on. Nor is there any water to drink. 
So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Um, I love to say this a lot. Sometimes you've got to get away from the noise and just talk, hang out with the Lord, talk to him. He gives you two ears, one mouth. We pray, but then we listen twice as much. Too many times we pray and then we get up and get on with our busy life. No, listen. This is an example, excellent example right here. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting, and they fell on their faces. Notice their posture. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Oh, this is good. Verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Here comes the assignment, by the way. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation of people together, Speak to the rock, I had the underlined, before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. In other words, there'll be so much water from this rock, not only will they get a drink, but the animals will too. Verse 9, so Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. I always say commands or assignments. Verse 10, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, hear now, you rebels. (laughs) I love that part. You know, as I was reading it, sometimes when I read scripture, I just get these visions. And (laughs) with my twisted sense of humor, it's always kind of crazy. So here's, when when I read that, hear now, you rebels. I also saw, uh, hear now, you punks, you complainers, you crybabies. Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Verse 11, then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Um, The Lord told him to speak to the rock, not strike the rock. I want you to catch that. That's where we're going. There's the disobedience. And Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly. So his prayer was still answered. But there's going to be a consequence to his sin. In other words, God wasn't going to cause everybody there and the animals to go without water because Moses messed up his assignment. That shows grace, by the way. Although God is a disciplinarian, he's a graceful God. So then the water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank. Verse 12, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron Because you did not believe me, in other words, just because you did not obey me, is what it's saying there, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Hmm. He didn't say to you all, because now you're not going. Wow. Hmm. Because you did not believe. In other words, because you did not disobey me. You shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Moses was was chosen by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. It was a big deal. But he faced discipline for the lack of faith and disobedience. When he struck the rock instead of speaking to it as instructed, God denied him entry into the promised land. Moses' story reminds us that the significance of following God's commands precisely and trusting in His plan is crucial. All right, now turn to 2 Samuel. This is a, the last <clears throat> of the three passages I want you to turn to. I told you it could be some turning. We're going to look at King David. Oh, King David got disciplined. You probably already know this story, and you probably already know the discipline, but we're going to look at it. 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. I love King David. He's probably my favorite character in the whole Bible. King David, the prophet Elijah, and the apostle Peter are my three. Those are my three amigos. I love all three of those guys. Anything and everything to do with those three. Good old King David. King David had it all. He'd been blessed with a kingdom, a powerful army, more money than he could ever spend. Then pride crept in to the guy that was known as the man after God's own heart. How do we know pride crept in, Pastor Danny? Because of his entitlement and how it was exposed when he desired and sent 
for another man's wife, Bathsheba. King David was starting to feel entitled. Pride crept in. Huh. God doesn't like pride. Um, pride got loose for thrown out of heaven, by the way. That's how much he hates it. Then King David gets uh, Bathsheba pregnant and then tries to hide his folly by sending her husband Uriah into battle and he's killed in battle. So now the man after God's own heart is not only a fornicator and adulterer, he's a murderer as well. That doesn't look good on your spiritual resume, especially if you're known as a man after God's own heart. But in a weird way, that's good news for all of us. I'm pretty sure all of us haven't been fornicating adulterers who murder people. If you are, I thought I knew you, but whatever. I'm pretty sure that's not in here. Anyway, if God can love King David and his, his squirrely ways, man, that makes me feel better. Because I mess up, but um, not too bad. All right, let's get through this. 2 Samuel chapter 12, 15 through 24, And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. Uh, in other words, God can destroy anything he creates, by the way. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. You, you hear me talk about desperation activation? Sometimes when we get desperate, it activates God. Well, it does here, but not in the way that you think and not in the way that David was hoping for. Watch this, I'll explain. Verse 17, So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. You know, it's bad when you don't eat. Verse 18, Then on the seventh day, um, numbers mean something in the Bible. Seven symbolizes completion. David's punishment was complete. Then on the seventh day, it came past that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. That part cracks me up. Nobody wants to deliver bad news to the greatest warrior of all time, to the guy who took down the giant. You want to tell him? I'm not telling him. You tell him. I'm not telling him. You tell him. Ain't nobody telling him. I thought that's kind of funny. He may do some harm. Verse 19, when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Notice how, uh, going into verse 20, notice how David's posture changes. This is a, this is a game changer here. This is awesome. Um, after being disciplined, which means losing his son, David's posture changes. It says, so David arose from the ground. That showed where he was. He was on his face before the Lord. Hmm. Remember, he's doing the desperation activation thing. David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself. That's important. Changed his clothes. There's new appearance. There's a, it, it, it's it's a, a, kind of like a new being. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Oh, there, 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 there's the deal right there. You know, King David could have been mad at God. God, what kind of God kills a little baby? <laughs> really? God, I've served you my whole life, this, that, and the other. Uh, uh, shaking his fist at God, you, 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 why a little baby? Take me out, but why the little baby? You know, he could have done that. No, he didn't do that. You know what he did? He cleaned himself up. He renewed his mind. He went to the house of the Lord and he worshiped. I love to say some things in life, you're going to have to worship your way through it. You just got to worship your way through it. It may not make sense. You may be heartbroken. You may be crushed, but you need to worship your way through it. God, things in my life are bad, but you're still a good God. You're still a good God. That's what David did right here. He went to the house of the Lord very first and worshiped the Lord. Lord, my life is just crushed right now, but you're still on the throne in heaven. You're still my God. I still have a heart for you, Lord. You know what this means? When he went to the house of God and he worshiped, it means he repented. He repented. And we know that because what happens afterwards. It says, then he went to his own house and he requested they set food before him and he ate. Whole new posture now. 
David renewed his mind. He'd repented. He'd changed his stinking thinking and got right with the Lord. Verse 21 says, Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. Watch this. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Watch this. Before, she wasn't his wife. She was somebody else's wife. Now, she is his wife. He went in to let... To her and lay with her so she bore a son and he called his name solomon watch this now the lord loved him Ooh. Mm. that is big right there king david known for his bravery and his devotion to god also faced discipline for his sins his affair with bathsheba and the subsequent murder of her husband led to the death of their child after king david's repentance a shift took place. God's grace began anew in the lives of David and Bathsheba. Their child Solomon would go on to be Israel's next king. An anointing and God's favor was on that little boy named Solomon. Another display of God's grace was that, quotation, he loved Solomon. Because David made it right. David, he, he was disciplined. And with that discipline, he took that discipline and he corrected his way. He repented, which means turn and go the other direction. Lord, I'm sorry for my lust. I'm sorry for the fornication. I'm sorry for the murder. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I repent, cleanse me, make me new. And the Lord says, I can work with that. And he did. I can work with that. All right. I'm going to go ahead and land the plane here. And uh, bring this to a, a close. Another one, just real quick, is Jonah. We know about Jonah. The Lord commanded Jonah to uh, go to Nineveh. And Jonah ran from the Lord. Jonah was disciplined as he was thrown overboard into a raging sea and swallowed up by a fish. Jonah repents in the belly of the fish and is delivered from it. More discipline. The, if you look through Scripture... There are so many people, godly people, people who are just on fire for God, have left everything behind to chase the Lord, do mission work, all that. They've been disciplined. They've been disciplined. God only corrects those he loves. I have a couple points here. A few points, actually. If you want to take notes. Um, as we close this, point number one, discipline should always lead to repentance. Discipline should always lead to repentance. Just as a child's discipline, there should be a change in behavior. There should be a spiritual shift. It's all part of the maturation process. We can all learn from King David. If you realize the Lord has given you a spiritual spanking, address it. Fall on your face before the Lord. Repent. Oh, Lord, there's areas of my life I know is just so out of line. Maybe there's a, a, a secret you have. Maybe some of you are talking online and your wife doesn't know about it, your husband doesn't know about it, and, you, and you're being convicted right now. Maybe you're looking at pornography. Uh, may, may, maybe you're uh, just neglecting your family. You should be spending more time with them. I could go on and on and on and on. You need to fall on your face before the Lord. Do what King David did. Renew your mind. Change your worldly posture to kingdom posture that lines up with God's word. Revelation 3.19 says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Wow. Mm. Point number two. Pruning can be considered a discipline. I love talking about pruning. Pruning stinks. Uh, pruning hurts. There's, it, there, it's painful. Um, it's never comfortable. It's always uncomfortable. Um, a lot of times pruning, uh, there's tears involved. 
Hebrews 12, 11. We, we said, we looked at earlier. Hebrews 12, 11, watch this. It says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. He's talking about pruning. It says, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Mm. Pruning brings on training. There's a growing process there. Those who bear bad fruit, by the way, it says in Scripture, if you bear bad fruit, you're cut down and thrown into a fire. If you produce good fruit, you're pruned. In other words, you're cut, so you'll bear much fruit. Here's the deal. Either way, God's going to cut you. That's how He grows us. That's discipline. So pruning can be discipline. Here's the deal. If God is pruning you, He's elevating you. That should be a bumper sticker. If God is pruning you, He's elevating you. Because He's only pruning you so you'll bear more fruit, much more fruit. So you might be producing some fruit, but by going through a pruning, now you're going to bear much fruit. So there's an elevation process. He's taking you into a new season. That's good news. Huh. Pruning is uncomfortable. It stings. It's painful. Like I said, there's a lot of tears involved. But pruning is God's way of disciplining his children to make us better, to elevate us, to lead us into a new season and our walk. It grows us into better, healthier followers. Amen. Point number three. We're almost done. God only disciplines those he loves. Mm. I hate to say it, but if, if you're getting a spiritual spanking, it's a good time to rejoice. <laughs> wow, Pastor Danny, that's an oxymoron. I know. But you know what that means? It means you're his. Oh, that's good. That means you're his. He only disciplines his children. You don't discipline other people's children. If you belong to him, he's our father in heaven. Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves discipline <laughs> loves knowledge. There's that oxymoron. But whoever hates correction, my favorite part, is stupid. So don't be stupid. <laughs> whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. That's in the Bible. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 1. <laughs> May just became my favorite verse. Don't be stupid. <laughs> be wise. Be wise. The attribute of God being a disciplinarian is a reminder that we should fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord has been lost in our culture today. As Christians, we should always be striving toward holiness and purity. We should be disgusted by our sin. Sin should shake us and bring us to our knees. We should fall on our face before the Lord. We should lose sleep over our sin. But there are so-called Christians out there sleeping comfortably with their sin in sin with no conviction our culture uh, no longer deals with sin they celebrate it instead thank you Lord for discipline your children that's, that's a, a tough message um, like I said it's not fun <laughs> but you know what Sometimes it's, it's not about fun. Sometimes uh, it's serious. And this is a serious message. Maybe somebody in here or somebody watching online is in the middle of a spiritual spanking. Maybe you know, God is not pleased with my behavior. God is not pleased with my choices. Well, you know what? It's time to do business with God pertaining to that. Let's do what King David did. First thing King David did is run to the house of the Lord and worshiped, which means he repented. He did business with God. He got things right with God. He's like, I cannot continue from this point forward until I first do business with God. Hmm. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. These things will be added unto you. He did that first. Wow. Thank you, Lord. I want us all to be considering something we may need to repent of, some things we need to get right with the Lord. We need to thank the Lord for discipline. That means we're His. So first we need to thank the Lord for, for loving me, saving me, 
sending your son to die for me. Everything that you've done for me as a Christian, as a follower. Because he deserves our best. He deserves our all. And he only disciplines us because he loves us. Amen? I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. And then I want us to just spend some time with the Lord. Lord Father God, it's a heavy message. I feel in my spirit it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an on-time message. The body of Christ needs to hear this. We need to fear you, not be scared of you, but fear you in reverence because you are God and we are not. Give us a kingdom mind to, to uh, grasp hold of this. Some of this stuff is hard. We're reading about people turning into pillars of salt. We're reading about babies dying. It's hard for us to make sense of that. So help us with that, Lord. Give us kingdom minds, not worldly minds. Reveal yourself to us in a more intimate way so we know uh, to live your ways, not our ways. Our ways lead to destruction. Your, way, your ways lead to paradise. And eternity with you, Father God. So help us and guide us, Lord. Shape us and mold us into the followers that you would have us be. Convict us, Lord. Put a Holy Spirit spotlight in areas inside of our heart that's hidden, that nobody knows about except for you. You are all-knowing. Expose that to us so we can do business with it, so we can repent and get it right. Show us our next steps, Father God. We love you. We chase after you, Lord. We give all of our hearts and all of ourselves to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I want to thank those of you online who are watching and hanging out. And uh, we sure adore you. Um, the messages uh, that you send are so encouraging and inspiring and uplifting. Keep us in your prayers. Keep me in your prayers. Um, we're going to go ahead and dismiss. And in-house we're going to spend some time praying so god bless and we'll see you next week